Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to first lecture of module 5 of this course called Game Theory and Economics. So we are going to start a new module uh, today. Before we start this new module, uh, let me just briefly take you through what we have discussed so far. So that will give a perspective as to what we are going to do today. Uh, in this course, basically, we are going to cover two main areas of game theory. These are called uh, and as a whole, these two uh, areas of game theory can be summed up in what is known as non-cooperative games. So in this uh, <coughs> uh, course, we are going to cover only non-cooperative games. There is something called cooperative game and which we are not going to cover. Uh, within non-cooperative games, we can broadly divide this uh, category of non-cooperative games uh, into two parts. One is the strategic games they are also called normal form game. Uh, we have seen some uh, examples of strategic games, how they are dealt with by the uh, notions of Nash equilibrium or by other notions of uh, solutions. For example, uh, the case of uh, the dominance, uh, the strict dominance and weak dominance and how we can eliminate the actions or strategies which are dominated and that also gives us some solutions. Uh, and there is another category within this non-cooperative games which is known as extensive games. So this is the second category and this is the, uh, this is the group of games that we shall start discussing today. Uh, extensive games are also called uh, sequential games. Uh, so what is the difference between strategic games and extensive games? The difference is uh, very simple and it is the following. If you remember in strategic games, uh, we assume that the players when they take their decisions, they do not take into account the decisions made by the other players. Now the fact that a player I for example does not take into account the decision by other players suppose J can be justified in two ways. Uh, first is that these two players I and J maybe 1 and 2 they are taking their decision simultaneously. Okay. So if the decisions are being taken simultaneously, uh, a player when he takes the decision obviously will not know what is the decision uh, that is being taken by the other player. And if he does not know then there is no way in which he can base his decision, uh, he can make his decision dependent upon the decision of the other player. So uh, we also say that the strategic games are uh, simultaneous moves game, move games. Uh, another way of justifying the fact that the players do not take into account the decisions of other players is to say that well it may happen that the decisions are taken simul not simultaneously but sequentially. So one after another 
but when a player says that I will take this decision, he submits his decision, the action that he will take right at the beginning of the game itself. So, right at the beginning of the game itself, he says for example, suppose player 1 makes a move in this stage and in the second stage suppose player 2 makes the move mm, and then suppose again player 1 makes a, uh, makes a move in the third stage. Now, obviously, since the game is unfolding in a sequential way, player 1 knows what player 1, player 2 knows what player 1 has done in the first stage. But a way to s justify the fact that player to cannot base his decision on player 1's decision is that he submits his actions in the beginning itself. Okay. So, in the beginning itself he says that ok I will play this action and he is committed to that action, uh, he cannot deviate once he says that I am going to play this action. So, since he cannot deviate, he has committed. Uh, so, it may happen that first player takes some decision with respect to his, with, with respect to which player 2's decision is not optimal, the decision that he said that he will take. But nevertheless, he has to stick to what he has said before, he has committed. So, this is another way of uh, justifying the fact that players, uh, it might happen that the, player, the game is structured in a sequential manner, the players are not moving simultaneously, but uh, nevertheless, since I am committing in the beginning itself, uh, there is no way uh, other players changing decisions uh, are going to affect my decision. Uh, similarly, here also player 1 the action that he will take in stage 3, he has committed this action in the first, uh, at the first, uh, at the beginning of the game itself. So, even if that action is not uh, optimal given what uh, player 2 has chosen in the second stage, uh, player 1 has to stick to his decision in the third stage. So, this is one way of justifying simultaneous move games, which basically if you, uh, uh, if you are careful with this uh, demonstration, uh, it basically uh, takes away the fact that the game is in fact sequential. Uh, it basically makes the game a simultaneous move game, it does not matter whether the game is structured in a sequential manner, uh, it the game boils down to a simultaneous move game because the actions are taken without taking into cognizance the actions of the other players. So, now what we are going to do from uh, today and subsequent lectures is to discuss extensive games. So, here in fact when a player takes a decision, he observes the decision taken by the other player and then he makes a move. So, he is not committing anything in the beginning itself, uh, the game is unfolding in a sequential manner and since it is unfolding in a sequential manner, everybody uh, looks into the actions taken by other players before he takes an action and uh, therefore, the things are known to me and I can base my decision on the actions taken by the other players. So, it is also to be uh, made clear that uh, for example, take this case ag again, <laughs> it might happen, it could have happened that player 1 is taking a decision in the first stage, but that action though it has happened before is not clearly known to player 2 who is taking the action in the second stage. So, there might be a problem of information, though the, the action has happened before and I am taking it as action at a later point of time, 
uh, the, the the information uh, regarding the previous action is not clear to me so that would have been a game with imperfect information but here the game that we are going to discuss the games that we are going to discuss are extensive games with perfect information meaning that whatever action uh, that has been taken uh, before I am taking my action is clearly known to me. There is no uncertainty. So, this is the genre of games that we are going to discuss. Now, since the game is structured in a sequential manner, uh, what are the key components that I need to know? First, obviously, I need to know the players, identity of the players who are involved. Second, of course, I have to know the, the, the preference of the players. Different players are there, their, their likings and dislikings will be different uh, regarding the outcome of the game. So, I have to know those likings and dislikings. Thirdly, what I need to know is how is the game sequenced? what are the sequences of actions that can be possible right because here you see a player one in first stage could take a number of actions so what are the actions that are available to him in player uh, in second stage also player two can take a number of actions and in third stage again you see player one is taking some actions and it is not necessary that this set of actions occurring in the first stage is going to be the same set of actions uh, which is occurring in the third stage. So, the set of action may be the same player is taking decisions at multiple stages, but the action set available to that particular player may go on changing. So, uh, instead of specifying the action set for each player which we were doing in case of a strategic game. If you remember in strategic game, what were, the, what were the three components? One was the set of players, second was the set of actions available to each player. Here set of actions available to each player uh, may go on changing uh, depending on the stage at which he is in. So what we do in uh, this extensive games? is that we do not specify the action set of each player because it goes on changing. So, it will be more complicated if we do try to do that. Instead what we do is specify all possible sequence of action that can happen in a particular game. And these possible sequences of actions are known as histories in particular terminal histories. Okay. Uh, so, terminal history is they, they refer to the sequences of actions which are possible in a particular game, but uh, merely specifying the sequences of actions which are possible let us look at it then we are not basically specifying which player is taking which action right we are just saying that there is this set of players and there are these uh, sequences of actions which are possible but i have to know at at a particular stage which is the player who is taking actions so that has to be made clear to me and that is made clear by this fourth component which is known as the player function. Uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, in a terminal history there are many points right because it is a sequence of actions. So, after some actions have taken place uh, in that small sequence within the larger terminal history sequence 
after that small sequence I have to know now whose play, which player's turn it is uh, who can take the action. So, given a small set of actions uh, I have to know now who is the player who can take an action and that function which tells me the identity of the player after a small sequence of actions that function will be called the player function. So, obviously now if I have a terminal history I can apply this player function on each and every point on that uh, terminal history and I will be able to know the identity of the player at, at those nodes at those points. So, th therefore, these are the four components uh, in an extensive form game if we in any extensive game if I know this uh, four components then I basically know everything that is no uh, everything that is no uh, needed to be known about that game. Now, what could be the illustration what could be the examples of extensive game with perfect information. Take the game of chess if I have to give a simple example a game of chess is a game extensive game with perfect information because the moves are made sim not simultaneously, but sequentially and each player uh, is aware of the moves made by the other player before he takes any action. And uh, so, it is a game of not only ex not only is it a game uh, which is extensive, but it is a game with perfect information. Uh, what could be the example of game which is an extensive game, but imperfect information. So, example blind chess what does it mean <coughs> well it's a it's a special kind of chess game where uh, what happens is that i am unaware of the moves made by the other player i cannot even see the pieces uh, of the other player where those pieces are located. I can see my piece uh, my pieces on the board, but I cannot see other uh, my rivals uh, pieces. When I want to make a move uh, if I want to make a particular move from this place to some other place it may happen that the, the, that move is not valid move because the other players pieces might be intervening. So, in that case I will be told whether that move is a valid move legitimate move or not that information I will be given, but nothing more than that. If it is a legitimate move I will be able to make that move, uh, but if it is an illegitimate move then I cannot make that move I have to make some alternative move. So, in this game uh, see this game is a game of imperfect information because I am not aware of the moves made by the other player though it is an extensive game because the moves are happening simultaneously uh, sequentially as it happens in a standard chess game. Uh, one can give more uh, uh, more uh, rooted real life example for example uh, let us take the case that there is a person who lives in Guwahati for example and he has a friend. So, this is x and this is x's friend who suppose lives in uh, Delhi and suppose uh, in day 1 this uh, friend who is located in Delhi is supposed to send some money to this person x who lives in Guwahati. So, this money uh, you know uh, if it is sent it will definitely come to this person x in day 2 in his bank. So, money will be credited to his bank account. Now, 
but there is uncertainty whether uh, whether this friend who is in Delhi uh, in day one has sent the money or not has sent the money. So, this person who is living in Guwahati on day two suppose he has two actions either he can go to the bank uh, to check whether the money is there or he may not go to the bank. Now, this action of his going to the bank or not going to the bank these two actions uh, they will give him they will be worthwhile going to the bank will be worthwhile if this friend has sent his him some money in uh, uh, in day one. So, depending on the actions by the friend in day one his action in day two may lead to different results. If he has indeed sent the money then going to the bank uh, and uh, checking the account will be worthwhile. If the first person has not sent the money then going to the bank and checking the account will be a futile exercise. So, here uh, X also is not sure whether in day 1 the friend has sent the money. So, he is not perfectly informed. So, this is a case a situation of uh, sequential uh, or extensive game uh, where the information is not perfect. <coughs> so, let me uh, come back to the perfect information game and uh, let me give another standard example of perfect information game extensive game with perfect information which is known as the entry game. So, what is the story here? So, it is a two player game player 1 is known as the challenger player 2 is known as the incumbent. Uh, incumbent is the one who is enjoying some privileges, some power, some payoff and the challenger currently is not enjoying anything, but he is thinking whether he will challenge the incumbent and uh, take a part of the power or privilege this incumbent is enjoying. So, uh, for the challenger he has two actions to choose from either he can come in, in means he is entering the race and he is challenging this incumbent or he can take the action out which means he is not coming in he is not challenging the incumbent. Uh, how, how this model can be visualized in real life? Take the case of a market uh, from economics if I have to give an example. Take the case of a market where there is a monopolist which means he is the only producer in the market. So, all the profit in the market he is the, he is the person who is enjoying all the profit. And uh, there is one rival firm who is not presently in the market, but he the, the firm uh, is thinking whether it will enter the market and try to compete with this incumbent firm who is the monopolist. So, now this other firm who is thinking of entering the market will be called a challenger and the monopolist is an incumbent. It can also be thought of uh, uh, as a political race for example, suppose there is a locality where there is an undisputed leader who wins the election no matter what there is no one to challenge him no, no one fights elections with him. Uh, so, he enjoys some privileges obviously he is winning the election. So, there are some uh, privileges and money associated with that seat and suppose there is a rival uh, person leader who is thinking whether I will challenge this uh, undisputed leader and fight and fight the election. So, that can also be 
that example can also be given. Uh, so, here the challenger has two action either to enter the race either to compete with the incumbent or not to compete staying out. If he stays out uh, then there is nothing to be done by the incumbent, incumbent is happy, he is as before, the status quo is, is maintained. But if the challenger gets in, <coughs> then the incumbent has to decide something. Now what he decides on is basically a set of actions, we shall say that there are two actions that the incumbent can take. Uh, so, here I am writing on the right side uh, actions that can be taken by the incumbent only if the challenger comes in, only if the challenger you know is interested in fighting. The incumbent can do two things, one is to fight, so the rival is coming into the market, the rival firm is entering the market. The incumbent firm is fighting with him in the sense that suppose the rival firm comes in and the rival firm charges a price a little less than, than the incumbent firm's price, then he will be able to get a large share of the market because customers will flock to uh, the challenger instead of the incumbent. But if he does so, by fighting I mean that the incumbent also follows suit, he also reduces the price. Uh, so, it might hurt his small run profit uh, because he is charging less price for the time being. So, his profit margin might be adversely affected, but he is now giving a fight to the challenger, he is not taking it lying down. However, the incumbent can also choose not to fight. And this uh, not to fight, we shall denote this by accommodate. So, for example, in the case of market, maybe the uh, challenger comes in and charges a price which is a little less than the incumbent's price. Then he is getting a large share of the market, he is getting some profits. But the incumbent uh, does not fight with him, he sticks to his price, maybe. Uh, he still gets some loyal customers because he is a old firm, for, so all the some of the customers will still come to him. So, this is a case of accommodation, the incumbent is not uh, keen to fight with the challenger. So, in this case, uh, if I have to translate this story in terms of the elements that I have seen here the players, the preferences, the terminal histories, the player function, how shall I write them? The players are two, one is the challenger and the incumbent. The second component let us write the terminal histories. If the challenger does not get in, if he stays out, then the game ends there because there is nothing to be done by the incumbent then, he is happy. So, here one terminal history could be out, the incumbent does not, uh, the, the challenger does not get in and we are maintaining the, maintaining the status quo. Other sorts of sequence of actions which are possible is that the challenger gets in and the incumbent fights with him. So, this is one sequence. After the fight has happened, then the game, game gets over, we are reaching the uh, terminal of the game. Uh, they, these two firms divide their. Uh, profits in some way. And uh, what could be the other possibility is that 
the challenger gets in and the incumbent uh, does not fight with him, he accommodates the challenger. So, let us write it down in and accommodate. So, these are the three possible sequences of actions uh, that there are in this game. Okay. What about the player function? Uh, if I have to talk about the player function, one thing must be made clear is that as I told before, player functions are dependent on some sequence of action, something has happened and then I have to know who is the player now who can take an action. So, that player's identity is given by the player function. So, uh, suppose there is a terminal history of this form. Suppose m, m actions are there. Now, this is a terminal history which is ending at a m, but I can construct many sub histories which are known as sub histories as subsets of this big terminal history. Now, what are the subsets of this history, uh, this terminal history? One could be phi itself, which means a null history, nothing has happened we are beginning at the beginning. And how are the other sub histories defined? They will be of the form a k where k is less than equal to m. Okay. So, this is a general form of a sub history of this terminal history. So, this is a terminal history. and this is a sub history okay. including uh, this null set all these are sub histories. If k is equal to m then we are including the main terminal history itself, but as we know any uh, set is the subset of its own. So, that sub history is considered the, the set itself the sub the terminal history itself is a sub history of its own. Uh, but we can consider some what is known as a proper sub history. Okay. So, proper sub history will be what? It will include phi plus it will include all the sub histories of this form where k is strictly less than m. So, the, the sub terminal history itself is not counted, but all the sub histories of the form a 1, a 2, a k where k is strictly less than m, uh, they will be proper sub histories of the terminal history. Sorry, this is sub history, proper sub history. Now, why did I mention all this? The reason I mention all this is that a player function is defined only over a proper sub history. Uh, because if I take into account the terminal history itself, uh, I cannot define a player function on that because the game is ending there. There is no one, no player left uh, who can take an action when the game ends. So, I have to remove this terminal history and look into the sub histories, proper sub histories and if there is a proper sub histories, which means that if there is a sequence of actions which has happened, then I have to know who is now the player who is going to move. So, in this case I have these three terminal histories uh, and what are the proper sub histories here? In case of out, the proper sub history is just 1, 5. In this case, if I forget about 5 because which has been included before, uh, the, there is only one proper sub history which is in. 
and from here also I will get two proper services phi and in. So basically in this game the which is called the entry game there are two proper subhistories. If I take into consideration all sorts of terminal histories. So one proper subhistory is phi and what does the player function on phi uh, give us? How do I know? Well, I know that if phi is the uh, history then who are the players who is the player that is making a move in the beginning of the game itself I know it is the challenger who makes a move so this is the challenger so this is the one player function and if in which is the other proper sub history is there then the player function defined over this gives me the incumbent. The reason being that if I if you remember the description of the game if in has happened that is if the challenger has taken the action in now the incumbent has to decide whether to fight with him or not to fight with him. So, that is why the player who makes a move after in is obviously the incumbent. Okay. And uh, finally the preferences. In this game, entry game. Now uh, there is nothing sac sacrosanct about uh, the preferences. Uh, but typically in this entry game it is assumed the standard assumption is that uh, and which is quite reasonable that suppose the challenger does not get in he stays out then what is the who is the player uh, who is getting the maximum sort of payoff in this case it is the incumbent because he is just uh, maintaining the status quo so that is the best for him so if I write this as I and out is the uh, is the terminal history. Now, one thing I should make, make clear here, here is that how is the preference defined on which it is defined. Uh, preferences are defined only if some terminal history has already happened. So, something has happened the game is not stuck in the midway uh, only in that case I can say whether a player how much a player likes that uh, that particular outcome. So, u i out is the best for player i. So, I shall denote it by 2 and uh, which is the case which is best for the for the challenger. In this game it is assumed that the challenger is best his best off that is he is getting the maximum payoff let us write it as C if he moves in and the incumbent does not fight. Okay. So, this is another terminal history in an accommodate and that is the outcome which is best for the challenger because the fighting is bad fighting is bad for the both both the parties and in typically we shall assume that uh, fighting is the worst possible case for the both the parties. So, this is one uh, what is the second best for the incumbent? We shall assume that the second best for the incumbent is that the challenger comes in and the incumbent accommodates. Uh, if there is a fight then that is the worst thing that can happen to uh, the incumbent. So, in an accommodate is the second best we shall, which we shall denote by 1 
and what is the second best uh, for uh, the first player that is the challenger is that he stays out because you see there are three possible cases either in fight in accommodate and staying out for the challenger the best is in accommodate and for the challenger the worst is the fight fighting case so the middle one the second best is the out terminal history and so th what is left to be done is just specifying that fighting is the worst for both the players where they are getting 0. So, this is how the preference uh, of the players are defined in this entry game. Uh, so, just to uh, recapitulate and uh, get back to the precise definition of this three components of extensive form gain. Uh, first, I have to specify the set of players who are the players who are involved. Second, what is known as terminal histories and how is it defined? a sequence set of sequences of actions such that no sequence is a sub history of other sequences. I should write proper service. So, uh, this set of sequences of actions such that no sequence is a proper service of other sequences, this set of sequences is called the set of service, the set of terminal histories. Okay. Uh, what was the reason for writing this the such that no sequence is a proper service tree of other sequences? Uh, by this basically we are ruling out uh, those sequences which are not complete, which are not reaching the end of the game. Uh, because if we are including some incomplete sequence which is basically a, a proper sub history, then the other sequence will also be included which is the terminal histories and the first one will be a subset of the second one uh, which we are basically ruling out by this criterion that no sequence can be a proper sub history of other sequence. And these sequences uh, will be called the terminal histories. Okay. Now, uh, before we mention the third point, uh, one point, one small point that can be made here is that uh, we are not ruling out infinite sequences. Basically, uh, the definition of the terminal histories that we have that it is a possible sequence of actions uh, that may include the case where the action this is this sequence is an infinite sequence. Uh, take the case of chess suppose that there are two players and they are just repeating their moves same moves of these two players are being repeated. Now, this game can go on and on to infinite periods of time. So, uh, that can also be a, a terminal history where it is not in fact terminating, it is going on uh, to, an, in, to an infinite extent. Uh, so, those things are there and in that infinite sequence also we can talk about proper sub history. So, the third point which is to be mentioned is the player function.
So, it is a function that assigns a player to each proper service tree. of a terminal history. So, if I have a terminal history then there are uh, many proper service trees of that terminal history. For each proper service tree I have to know who is the player now who can make a move that is a player function and finally, the preferences. Preferences are defined over terminal histories. If the game is somewhere stuck in between and some players are still there who will uh, take an action, take actions, then we cannot talk about preferences because the game has not completed. So, preferences are defined over the set of terminal histories. So, these are the uh, three important uh, four important components uh, that are to be mentioned in case of any sequential game any extensive game. Uh, one useful way to represent uh, extensive game is to draw what is known as a game tree. A game tree basically it summarizes all these uh, four components in a very neat way. Uh, if I have to draw the game tree of the uh, entry game which we have just discussed, it will be like the following. <coughs> so, we start with a circle here and uh, this is an empty circle, uh, this is where the game starts. If you remember the game starts with the movement made by the challenger, he has to take a decision. So, in this node, this is also known as a node. In this node, I have to write the identity of the person who is making a move here. In this case, it is the challenger. Now, how many actions? Uh, does the challenger have in the first node. Now, one important thing is that in case of uh, uh, extensive game, we do not specify the action set of the players, but from the terminal histories uh, which for which the information we have and the player function, we can figure out what are the action sets what are the action sets available to the players at different nodes. For example, I know if you look at the game uh, that these are the terminal histories and the terminal histories are written in a particular way. First action that can be taken is the first component, it can be out, it can be in, it can be in. So, basically we get two sorts of action and who is the player who is taking the first action? It is the challenger, right? P5 is the challenger which means if nothing has happened, the game is in the beginning itself, it is the challenger who is making a move. How many moves can he make? That we can, that information we can get from the set of terminal histories. He can make two sorts of moves. So, I write I draw two lines two slanting lines uh, in for the first action and out for the second action. Okay. Uh, now, if 
he chooses out the game ends there. So I don't have to write, I, I don't have to draw anything else, the, the tree ends there. However, if he plays in, then it is the turn of the second player to make a move because how do I know this? Because I know that in is followed by two sorts of action, two possible actions, fight and agavonded, okay. And after in the player function is incumbent. So, from these two information, I know what to draw. I have to write the, uh, the, the identity of the player here who can make an action, who can take an action and this is incumbent because I know P in is the incumbent. And uh, from this two sorts of histories can follow. So, basically there are two actions available to the incumbent here. One is a fight, the other is accommodate, alright. And uh, there the game ends because uh, this is the longest uh, source of terminal history that can happen. It can possess two components. There is no terminal history which has more than two components. So, this is where the game ends. And then I write down the payoffs of the players at the term at the termination points. So, I have to write the payoffs of the players here, here and here. For that also I have uh, information. Uh, if the challenger is choosing out, then he is getting 1. So, I write 1 and if out happens, then the incumbent is getting 2. So, there is an order that I am maintaining here. Uh, the first element in the payoff function in this in this uh, bracket within the bracket uh, the first element denotes the payoff to the first player. Who is the first player? The player who makes the first move, the challenger. So, 1 is the payoff of the challenger and the second component, 2 is the payoff to the incumbent. Uh, if the terminal history is in and fight, then what are the payoffs? The payoffs are 0, 0, both of them. And if the terminal history is in and accommodate, then the challenger is getting 2 this is the best for the challenger and the incumbent is getting 1. So, it is 2 1. So, this is the game tree for the entry game. All right. uh, so, this is how uh, the, the all the information, the 4 information that are uh, needed to be known for any extensive game can be represented in terms of a diagram. Uh, one more thing uh, regarding this action set uh, of a player and how it is defined. Uh, this is very simple. Suppose H is a sub history, is a proper sub history. And suppose P H is I, all right. Then the action set available to I after the sub history has happened is, uh, is defined in the following way. It comprises of uh, the actions 
of the form A such that H A is a history. Now, this history it no, is not necessarily a proper sub history, it might be a terminal history also, but uh, the, the point is that if there is a proper sub history which is denoted by H and if it so happens that H A is a possible sequence of actions, it is a feasible sequence of actions which means it is a history, then uh, A will be in the action set of player I after H has happened. So, action set of any player is defined over a proper sub history. So, uh, that is more uh, that is more or less what uh, we shall uh, be uh, ending with in this section in this lecture. Before we finish uh, what we have been discussing so far, we have basically started with the discussion of extensive game where the actions are taken step by step in a sequential sequential manner and if that is the case then uh, I have said that there are four components that have to be mentioned. One is the uh, set of players, who are the players who are involved. Second is related to the terminal histories, the set of terminal histories which means what all possible uh, sequence of actions which are which can be possible in this game and uh, such that no sequence of action is a proper sub history of other sequence of actions. Third is the player function which are defined which is defined over uh, proper sub histories of terminal histories and fourthly the preferences of the players which are defined over terminal histories. So, we shall pick up the thread in the next class, uh, thank you. First specify the main features of an extensive game with perfect information through an example. Now, we know that in a strategic game, if we have a strategic game, <coughs> then the time factor is suppressed. So, it is as if the players uh, decide what they will play in the very beginning of the game and then if the game is unfolding over time, they do not deviate uh, from the initial announcement. So, plans are made in the beginning and are not changed. So, whatever be the action of other players, I do not waver from my initial announcement of actions. So, this is uh, one interpretation of strategic game. The other interpretation of strategic game is that it is a simultaneous move game. That the players are making their moves at the same point of time. So, even they, if they wanted to change their move according to other players actions, they cannot do so because the actions are taken simultaneously beforehand you cannot know what the other player is going to play. So, you cannot uh, make your action dependent on the action of the other players because you do not know what is the action of the other player. So, this was the case of strategic game in extensive game. it is uh, different here. What we have in extensive game is that the game unfolds over time. So, you do not have a simultaneous move game, but a game which progresses stage by stage 
and players take actions depending on other players actions. So, the time dimension is present. Let me give an example. So, suppose uh, a batsman and a bowler, these are the two players. <coughs> The bowlers can bowl a fast ball, we shall call it F or a slow ball, okay. uh, and looking at the ball, the batsman can play two shots, let us call S1 this is suitable for F that is for a fast ball or he can play S 2 which is suitable for a slow ball S. Now, here what is happening is that first the batsman is making a move and then the bowler is making a move uh, depending on what uh, uh, sorry first the bowler is making a move then the batsman is making a move and the batsman is making the move depending on how the bowler is bowling. So, uh, I can show this in terms of a game tree. So, F or S if F is played then the batsman moves if S is played again the batsman moves and he has in either case two sorts of actions S 1 or S 2. So, here uh, the actions of the second player it is dependent on the action of the first player. Uh, second question what are the ma main four components of an extensive game with perfect information? main four components is the player set, second main component is the set of terminal histories, each terminal history is a, a sequence of actions such that no sequence of action is a subset of some other sequence of actions. Thirdly player function given a non terminal history we should know who is the player now uh, who is required to make a move. And fourthly for each player preference over set of terminal histories. So, each player must specify which terminal history he prefers the most, which second second most etcetera etcetera. So, these are the four important components of uh, an extensive game with perfect information. Thank you.